Chapter Six of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Evening at Violette. After supper, Kate got out the good coffee cups and they waited for the vinnies. Kate was rather pink and wore a severe blouse in which she looked plain. It was a mortification she thought she ought to practice when the vinnies came. Evie was skilfully altering a hat. Alex made a pen and ink sketch of her as she bent over it. Mrs. Frampton knitted a sock. The evening thrill came in, and Kate opened it, for Mrs. Frampton liked to hear tidbits of news while she worked. "'Stories impossible to doubt,' read Kate in her prim, precise voice, "'reach us continually of atrocities practised by the enemy.' She read several, unsuitable for these pages. Mrs. Frampton clicked horror with her tongue. The papers she took in were rich in such stories. As it was impossible to doubt them, she did not try. Possibly they gave life a certain dreadful savour. To think of the march of civilization and this still going on, Mrs. Frampton commented. I'm sure anyone would think they'd be ashamed. Kate said with playful acidity, Kate had reached what with many is a playful age, Thank you, Alex. Thank you ever so much, Alex, for getting between me and the lamp. Alex moved, her attempt foiled. Kate read next the letter of a private soldier at the front. The Bosch are all cowards. They can't stand against our boys. They fly like rabbits when we charge with the bayonet. You should hear them squeal, like so many pigs. There's not a German private in the army that wants to fight. The officers have to keep flogging them on the whole time. Poor things. I'm sure one can't but be sorry for them, said Mrs. Frampton. Knit two and make one, purl two, slip one, pass a slip one over, drop four and knit six. Or anyhow, something of that sort, for she had got to the heel as one unfortunately at last must. "'It's wonderful how long the war goes on, since all the Germans are like that,' said Kate, without conscious irony, as she took up her own knitting. Hers was a body belt. "'I believe this new wool is different from the last, somewhat stringier, it seems. Brown will have to take it back if it is.' "'I say, just fancy,' said Evie. Those sequin tunics at B and H's have come down to seven and eleven and three. I think I could rise to that, even in war time. The war mainly affected Evie by reducing the demand for hats, and consequently lowering the salary she received at the exclusive and ladylike milliners where she worked. As she spoke, she caught sight of her three-quarter likeness as etched by Alex. Goodness gracious! she commented. You've made me look anything on earth. I mayn't be much, but I hope I'm not that sort of freak. It's very good, said Alex complacently. Rather particularly good. I shall take it to the school on Monday and show it to Mr. Bendish. It may be good, said Evie, since you say so. All I say is it isn't me. It's more like some wild woman out of a caravan. Don't you go telling people it's me, or they'll be coming to shut me up. There's the bell. That's them. The Vinnie party arrived. It consisted of Mr. Vincent Vinnie, a bright young solicitor of twenty-eight, his lately acquired wife, a pretty girl who laughed when he was witty, which was often, his young brother Sidney, a stout, merry youth of nineteen, a bank clerk, and their cousin Miss Simon, the fat girl in the sailor blouse, which was, it seemed, her evening toilette also. In case some should blame the Vinney brothers for not taking an active part in the war, it may be remarked that the elder supported a wife and the younger a mother, that they represented a class which, for several good reasons, produces fewer soldiers than any other, and that they both belonged to the Clark's Drill Corps and wore several flags on their bicycles. And young Mrs Vinney belonged to a voluntary aid detachment, not at present in working. They came in with the latest news. The British had been driven back out of a thousand yards of trench they had taken. They hadn't enough ammunition. Well, 
said Mrs. Frampton, knitting, and really more interested in her heel than in the fortunes of war. It's all very dreadful to think of, but I suppose we must leave it in the hands of the Almighty, who always moves in a mysterious way. Mrs. Frampton had been brought up evangelically, and so mentioned the Almighty more casually than Kate, who was high, thought fit. Well, what I say is, said young Mrs. Vinney, who was of a cheerful habit, it's not a bit of use being depressed by the news, because no one can ever tell if it's true or not. It's all from that bureau, and we all know what they are. Why, they said there weren't any Russians in England, when everyone knew there were crowds. And they always say the Zepp raids don't do any damage to factories and arsenals, and everyone knows they do. They don't seem to mind what they say. Well, for my part, Evie said, I don't see why we shouldn't all be as chirpy as we can. We can't help by being glum, can we? That's just it, said Mrs. Vinney. Now there's the theatre. Of course you know Vin and I wouldn't go to anything really festive just now, like the girl on the garden wall, but I'm not ashamed to say we did go to the man who stayed behind. Why wouldn't you go to anything really festive? Alex asked, curious as to the psychology of this position. Mrs. Vinney looked round for sympathy. "'Why, what a question! It's not the moment, of course. One wouldn't like to. You wouldn't, would you?' "'Oh, me, I'd go to anything I thought would amuse me.' "'Well,' Mrs. Vinney decided, "'I suppose you and I aren't a bit alike. I just couldn't, and there it is. I dare say it's all my silliness. But with the men out there in such danger, and laying down their lives the way they're doing—' "'Well, I couldn't sit and look at the girl on the garden wall, "'not if I had a stall free. "'The way I see it is, the men are fighting for us women, "'and where should we be but for them? "'And the least we can do is not to forget all about them, "'seeing gay musical plays. "'The way I'm made, I suppose, "'and I don't pretend to judge for others.' "'It's all a question of taste and feeling,' Kate pronounced absently more interested in a new stitch she was introducing into her body belt. The fat, dark girl Miss Simon came in on the mention of women. It was her subject. Women's work in wartime is every bit as important as men's, that's what I say, only they don't get the glory. Mrs. Vinney giggled and looked at the others. Now Rachel's off again. She's a caution when she gets on the woman question. She spent most of her time in Holloway in the old days, didn't you, dear? She thinks she ought to have the vote, Sid Vinnie explained to Alex in a whisper. Alex, who had hitherto moved in circles where everyone thought, as a matter of course, that they ought to have the vote, disappointed him by her lack of spontaneous mirth. Miss Simon was inquiring, undeterred by these comments, Who keeps the country at home going while the men are at the war? Who brings up the families? Who nurses the soldiers? What do women get out of a war ever? The salvation of their country, Miss Simon, said Mrs. Frampton, won for them by brave men. After all, said Sid, the women can't fight, you know. They can't fight for their country. Miss Simon regarded him with scorn. How much are you fighting for your country, I'd like to know? "'One for you, Sid,' said Evie cheerily, ignoring Sid's aggrieved. "'Well, you know I can't leave Mother.' "'And fighting isn't everything,' Miss Simon went on. "'And wartime isn't everything. "'There's women's work in peacetime. "'What about Octavia Wills that did so much for housing? "'Wasn't she helping her country? "'And for war work, what price Florence Nightingale? "'What would the country have done without her?' "'and what did she get out of all she did?' "'Mrs. Frampton, who had not read the life of that strong-minded person, "'but cherished a mid-Victorian vision of a lady with a lamp, "'sounder in the heart than in the head, said, "'She kept her place as a woman, Miss Simon.' "'Evie, who was not listening much, finding the subject tedious, put it vaguely. "'After all, when it comes to fighting, we are left in the lurch, aren't we?' "'Sid said,' "'Oh, dear, no, Miss Evie. What price Christabel and company? They ought to have had the Iron Cross all round, the militant sort. They did more to earn it than the Huns ever did.' Cheap sarcasm, 
said Miss Simon, is no argument, and I don't blame any woman for using what means she's got. There are times when a woman's got to forget herself. Kate said, I don't think a woman's ever got to forget herself, and there was a murmur of applause. Alex giggled. She wondered if social evenings at Violette were often like this. "'You don't understand,' said the round-faced girl helplessly. "'You may be all right in your station of life, "'but you've got to look at other women's, the poor. "'We've got to do something about the poor. "'The vote would help us.' "'There have always,' said Mrs. Frampton, "'been the poor, and there always will be.' "'That's just why,' suggested Alex, momentarily joining in. "'It might be worth while to do something about them.' Miss Simon looked at her in sudden gratitude. She had a misplaced and soon quenched hope that this seemingly indifferent and amused girl might prove an ally. Kate said placidly, Well, they say that if you were to take a lot of men and women and give them all the same money, they'd all be quite different again tomorrow. Mrs. Frampton added that she went by the Bible. The poor ye shall have always with you. Mrs. Frampton, it doesn't say that, and even if it did, well, it's as Miss Sandemir says, it's all the more reason for thinking about them. Anyhow, you can't take the Bible that way. It's nothing to do with it. It's the plain word of God, and that's sufficient for me, said Mrs. Frampton repressively. Vincent Vinney, tired of the poor, who are indeed exhausting, regarded in the mass as a subject for contemplation, brought the discussion back to women. "'What I'd like to know is, where is a woman to get her knowledge from, if she's to help in public affairs? A man can pick up things at his work and his club, but a woman working in the house all day has no time even to read the papers, and if she did, her husband wouldn't like her to start having opinions, perhaps different to his.' There are far too many divorces and separations already because husbands and wives go different ways. And it would be worse than ever, eh, Flossie? Mrs. Frampton said, We heard of a woman only last month who went out to a public meeting, something about foreign politics, I think it was, and her baby fell onto the fire and was burnt to a cinder, poor little love. Well, she might just as likely have been going out shopping. But she wasn't, said Kate conclusively. I don't think, said Mrs. Frampton, that a woman desires any more than her home and her husband and children, if she's a proper woman. Evie's contribution was, Well, I must say I do prefer men to girls, and I don't mind saying so. Sid's was, I heard of a man whose wife took to talking about politics, and he hung his coat to one peg in her wardrobe and his trousers to another, and he said, Now, Eliza, which will you wear? It was apparently the combination of this anecdote and Evie's remark before it that broke Miss Simon down. She suddenly collapsed into indignant tears. Everyone was uncomfortable. Mrs Frampton said kindly, Come, 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 my dear, it's only talk. It isn't worth crying about, I'm sure, with so many real troubles in the world just now. You won't see sobbed Miss Simon, who looked particularly plain when crying. "'You none of you see, except her,' she indicated Alex, "'and she won't talk. She only smiles to herself at all of us. "'You tell silly tales, and you say silly things, "'and you think you've scored, but you haven't. "'It isn't argument that you like men more than women or women more than men.' And that man married to Eliza was an idiot, and not a bit funny or clever, and you all think he scored over her. Well, really, said Sid, and grinned sheepishly at the others. Kate had fetched a glass of water. Drink some, she said kindly. It'll make you feel better. But Miss Simon pushed it aside, and mopped her eyes, and blew her nose, and pulled herself together. Two. Fancy crying before every one, thought Evie, and just from being in a passion about getting the worst of it in talk, she is a specimen. 
The boy shouldn't draw Rachel on to make such a silly of herself, thought young Mrs. Vinney. Poor girl, she must have been working too hard. She's quite hysterical, thought Mrs. Frampton. Having her staying with them must draw Vin and Floss very close together, thought Kate, who had loved Vin long before Floss met him. We shan't have any more fun out of this evening. We'll go home, thought Vincent, and glanced at his wife. What a difference between one girl and another, thought Sid, and gazed at Evie. I wonder if many people are like these, thought Alex, speculating. Were discussions at Violette, discussions in all the thousands of Violettes, always like this? Not argument, not ideas, not facts. Merely statements, quotations rather, of hackneyed and outworn sentiments, prejudices second-hand, yet indomitable, unassailable, undying, and the relation of stories without relevance or force, and, but this much more rarely, surely, a burst of bitterness and emotion to wind it all up. Curious. Rachel Simon, like the rest, was stupid and ignorant, her brain a chaos of half-assimilated, inaccurate facts. She said wills when she meant hill, and crude sentiments. She seemed to belong, oddly, to an outworn age. The late eighties, was it? Alex wasn't old enough to know. But Alex was sorry for her, remembering the look in her face when they had in each in turn dealt her a finishing blow. Alex rather wished Evie hadn't made that idiotic remark about men and girls, wished Mrs. Frampton hadn't talked of proper women, wished Kate hadn't said, but she wasn't, even wished she herself had joined in a little, only it was all too inane. 3. To change the subject, Vincent Vinney said they had collared another German baker spy down in Camberwell. These bakers said Mrs. Frampton. Do seem to be dreadful people. We've left off taking our hovis loaf since they found that wireless in Camberwell the other day. You can't be too careful, can you? said Mrs. Vinney. For my part, I'd like to see every German in England shut up in jail for a life sentence. But we must be trotting, Mrs. Frampton, or we shall miss our beauty's sleep. Good night. We've enjoyed the evening awfully. Oh, Evie, I've got those blouse patterns from Harrods. Can you come round tomorrow afternoon and help me choose? Come early and stay to tea. You too, Kate, won't you? You are a girl. You never come when I ask you. Kate looked uncomfortable and helped Miss Simon, now composed, but looking plainer than ever, with her red eyes and nose, into her coat. To see the Vinnies together by their own fireside was rather more than Kate could bear, though she had a good deal of stolid outward endurance. Her hand shook as she handled the ugly green coat. She wanted to avoid shaking hands with the Vinnies, but she could not. The familiar physical thrill ran through her at Vincent's hearty clasp and left her limp. "'I'm afraid it's commencing to rain,' said Kate. "'Good night, all,' said Mrs. Frampton. We've had quite a little discussion, haven't we? I'm sure one ought to talk things out sometimes. It improves the mind. Now, I do hope you won't all get wet. You must take our umbrellas. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Hospital. About a week later, Alex and Noni McClure went to see Basil Doy in hospital. Hate hospitals, don't you? Noni remarked as they entered its precincts. I've a sister VADing here, Peggy. You know her. She's having a three months course. But I've not been to see her yet. I can't remember her ward. It's a men's surgical, I think. We'll go and find her afterwards. I don't think she'll be able to stick her three months because of her feet. They swell up so. They make the nurses stand all the time, you know, even when they're doing needlework and things. She says half the nurses in the hospital have foot and leg diseases. Silly, isn't it? 
The VADs could sit down sometimes, but they don't like to when the regulars mayn't. They're unpopular enough as it is. Peggy asked the staff nurse in her ward why all the nurses didn't combine and asked to have the standing room altered, but she only said you can't get hospital rules altered. They are like that. Nurses must be idiots. They crossed the court that led to the wing with the officers' wards. It was dotted with medical students. Rabbits, Noni considered them. All that are left of them, I suppose. Peggy says they're mostly rather rotters. They have a great time with the nurses. One of them tried to have a great time with Peggy the other day, but she wasn't having any. The Royal Family Wing we want, don't we? Darwin? Lister? No, that must be men of science. I suppose that's ours, up those stairs. It was one of those hospitals in which the wards are named after persons socially or intellectually eminent. In the wing Noni and Alex wanted, the wards were entitled Victoria, Albert, Edward, Alexandra, Princess Mary, George, and so forth. One, named doubtless in happier international times, was even called Wilhelm. Out of Wilhelm, as they passed its glass door, came four figures, white-clad from head to foot, wheeling a stretcher on which lay a round-faced little girl of sixteen trying to smile. "'Going down to the theatre. Noni whispered. "'Rather shuddery, isn't it?' Two. They entered Albert Edward, which was a small ward of twelve beds, used just now for officers. It smelt of iodoform. Several of the beds had visitors round them. Some of the patients were in wheeled chairs, smoking. One in bed was singing, unintelligibly, in a high, shrill voice. At the table by the centre window, two nurses stood, a probationer and a VAD, making swabs and talking. They looked tired and were very young. The other two nurses, the staff nurse and the super, were talking to two of the patients. They had learnt not to look so tired. Also, perhaps, the pleasant excitement of being in Albert Edward bore them up. The staff nurse said, Mr. Doy, that's his bed over there, nine. He's up in a chair this afternoon. He's in pretty bad pain most of the time. They may have to amputate, but the doctor hopes to manage without. Alex and Noni went across the ward to nine, where Mr. Doy, in a brown dressing gown, sat in a wheeled chair, smoking a cigarette and talking to the super, who was rather nice-looking and had auburn hair. In the next bed lay the singer, with fixed blue eyes and flushed cheeks, and a capelline bandage round his head, carolling German songs in a high, monotonous voice. "'Quite delirious, poor thing,' the super explained to the visitors. "'His nerves are all to bits. He was a prisoner till he got exchanged. And would you believe it? They'd never taken the shrapnel out of his head. He went under operation for it here last week. She moved away, whispering first to Noni behind the patient's back. He has to be kept pretty quiet, please. The pain gets bad on and off. Hello, said Basil Doy, smiling at them. This is great. He had a soft, rather quick way of speaking. Today he was huskier than usual, perhaps because he was ill. He was long and slim. He had used in pre-war days to lounge and slouch, but possibly did that no more. Anyhow, today he merely lay limply in a chair so they could not judge. His long pale face and flexible mouth and dark eyebrows were always moving and changing. So were his rather bright eyes that kept shading and glinting from green to hazel. His forehead and rumpled hair were damp just now, either from the heat or from some other cause. His bandaged right hand was raised in a sling. "'You do look an old wreck,' said Noni frankly. "'What did you go and do it for? A silly way of getting wounded, I call it, playing ball with bombs?' "'Rotten, wasn't it? But it would have played ball with me if I hadn't. It was bound to go off in a moment, you see, and I naturally tried to house it with the foe first. One often can. My mistake, I know. These little things will happen. I say, you're the first people I've seen from the shop. How's it going? 
Who are the good people this year? They began to tell him. He listened, fidgeting with restless eyes. Have a smoke, he broke in. No, I suppose you mustn't hear. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. They were talking about the exhibition in Grafton Street. I must get round there, he said, when I'm not so tied by the leg. How long will they keep you here, do you imagine? Haven't an earthly. They may be depriving me of a finger or two in a few days, or not. They don't seem to know their own minds about it. Good Lord, murmured Noni, taken aback. I say, don't let them. You, you'd miss them so. Halli, hallo, halli, hallo, by aunt's gate simmer so, shrilled number eight. Doy moved impatiently. He ought to be taken away, poor beggar. I loathe hospitals. People who are ill oughtn't to be with other people in the same miserable condition. It's too depressing. One wants the undamaged as an antidote. That's why visitors are so jolly. His restless eyes glanced at Noni's dark, glowing brilliance in her yellow frock, and at Alex, pale and cool and thin in green. Above all, he added, one wants sanity and normalness and cheeriness, not people with their nerves in rags like that poor chap. H broke out again, half singing, half humming, some student's chorus, tra la la in de quartier The auburn-haired nurse came and stood by him for a moment, quietening him. Come now, come now, you must be quiet, you know. Rather a pleasant person, that nurse, said Doy when she had gone. Jolly hair, hasn't she? Alex, he added, do you know, you don't look up to much. Is it overwork, or merely the air of London in June? It's the air of hospitals, I expect, Noni answered for her. She turned white directly we got into the ward. Beastly places, Basil agreed. Alex began to talk rather fast. She told stories of the other people at the art school. Noni joined in, and they made Basil laugh. He talked too, also fast. His unhurt hand drummed on the arm of his chair. His forehead grew damper. His eyes shifted about under his black brows. He talked nonsense, absurdly. They all did. They all laughed, but Basil laughed most. He laughed too much. He said it was a horrible bore out there. Funny, of course, in parts, but for the most part irredeemably tedious and no reason to think it would ever end except by both sides just getting too tired of it to go on. Idiotic business, chucking bombs over into trenches full of chaps you had no grudge against and who wished you no ill, and they chucking bombs at you, much more idiotic still, the whole thing hopelessly silly. Halgenacht, Halgenacht, trilled eight, with a nightmare of Christmas on him. Oh, damn, muttered Basil and got scarlet, and then white. The staff nurse came to them. She was not auburn-haired, but efficient and good-looking, and dark, with a clear, sharp voice. I think your visitors had better go now, Mr. Doy. She made signs to them that he was in pain, which they knew before. They went. He joked as he said good-bye, and they joked back. As they left the ward, H's wild voice rose in a sad air they knew. Mein beer and wein, frisch and klar, mein Töchterlein liegt auf der toten bar. Come now, come now, admonished staff. 3. On the stairs they met a tall woman with a long pale face and black hair, and eyes full of green light. She stopped and said to Alex, "'How do you do? Basil told me you were going to see him today, so I left you a little time. "'He mustn't have too many at once. He has a lot of pain for so slight a thing. "'I shall be glad when I can get him away for a change.' "'Her eyes, looking at Alec's pale face, were kind and friendly. "'She liked Alex, who was Basil's friend, and had stayed with them last summer in the country. "'She thought her clever and attractive, if selfish.' She hurried on through the glass door into Albert Edward. "'Mrs. Doy, isn't it?' said Noni. "'Must have been just like him twenty years ago. 
I say, how sickening, isn't it, people getting smashed up like that? Poor old Basil. All on edge, I thought, didn't you? What rot he talked. I say, if he loses those fingers, it will be all U.P. with his career. I don't expect he will. She shot a glance at Alex, whom she suspected of feeling faint. Let's come and find Peggy. I haven't an earthly where her ward is. It's called after some man of science, but there are so many of these, and all are so much alike. If it was painters, said Noni presently, I might have remembered. Who are the men of science? Darwin, suggested Alex intelligently. Galileo, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Oliver Lodge, lots more. Well, let's try this passage. They tried it. It led them on and on. It looked wrong, but might be right in such a strange world as a hospital, where anything may be right or wrong, and you never know till you try. They saw at last, ahead of them, a closed door. Not a glass door, but a baize one. From behind it, screaming came, wild, shrill, desperate, as if someone was being hurt to death. Oh, Lord, said Noni, it's a theatre. Look, it's written on the door. Come away quick. There must be an operation on. Beyond the door there was a shuffling and scuffling. It was pushed open, and two figures muffled in white, like the stretcher women, dragged out a Red Cross girl in a faint. Fetch her some water, said one. Idiot, why didn't she come out before she went off? These Red Cross girls. All right, she's coming round. I say, you know, you mustn't do that again. People are supposed to come out of the theatre before they faint, not after. It's an awful crime. Is it your first operation? Well, it was silly of them to send you down to such a bad one. I expect the screaming upset you. She didn't feel anything, you know. Here, drink this. You're all right now, aren't you? I must get back. You'd better go up to your ward and ask your sister if you can lie down for a bit. Alex and Noni had retreated down the passage. What a place! Alex was muttering savagely. Oh, what a place! They came out on a different staircase. Fleeing down it, they were in a corridor, long and unhappy, and full of hurrying house surgeons and nurses and patients' friends, for it was visiting hour. 4. Huxley, said Noni suddenly. That's the creature's name. I say, she accosted a fat little nurse with strings. Where's Huxley, please? Huxley was far away. They reached it through many labyrinthine and sad ways. Through the glass door they saw a keen-faced doctor going from bed to bed with an attendant group of satellites, medical students, who laughed at intervals because he was witty, either about the case in hand or about some other amusing cases this one recalled to his memory or at the foolish answers elicited from some student in response to questions. They were a cheery set, and this doctor was a wit. Every few minutes he washed his hands. The ward sister companioned him round, and by the window stood four nurses at attention, the staff nurse, the probationer, and two VADs with red crosses on their aprons. It was a men's surgical ward. It was long and light, and had twenty-one beds and cot. Cot was in the middle of the ward. He was there and had peritonitis of the stomach, and he sat up on his pillow and wept and wailed at intervals. Want to do home, want to do home. You're not the only one, Sonny, number three told him bitterly. We all want that. Twenty-one sad faces apathetically testified to his truthfulness. Twenty-one weary sick men, whose rest had been broken at dawn because the night nurses had to wash them all before they went off duty, and that meant beginning at three-thirty or four, stared with sad hollow eyes and wanted to go home. The doctor washed his hands for the last time and went, his satellites after him. The probationer respectfully opened the door for them. Noni and Alex stood back out of the way as they passed. Then known as Peggy, who had seen them long since, came and fetched them in. "'I am glad to see you,' she said. Noni said, "'You look dead, my child,' and she returned. 
"'Oh, it's only the standing. We're all in the same box. She,' she indicated the probationer, "'fainted this morning, and the staff nurse has the most awful varicose veins. I believe most nurses get them sooner or later. They ought to be let to sit down when they get a chance for sewing and things, but hospital rules are made of wood and iron. The other Red Crosser and I do sometimes sit when sister's out of the ward, but it's rather bad form, really, when the regulars mayn't. Funny places, hospitals. I've been getting into rows this morning for not polishing the brights bright enough. Staff told me they had quite upset sister. Sister's very easily upset, unfortunately. Staff's a jolly good sort, though. But look here, you must go. It's time for tea trays. I shall have to be busy. I'll come round tonight after I'm off, Noni, if I can get so far. You've got to go now. Staff's looking at us. They went. Staff called wearily to Peggy. Go and help Nurse Baker with trays, will you, dear? And you might take Daddy Thirteen's basin away. He's done being sick for now, I dare say, and he's going to drop it onto the floor in a moment. Peggy hurried, but was too late. These things will happen sometimes. 5. Hate hospitals, don't you? said Noni, as she had said when they entered. They were going out at the gates now. I suppose they have to be, though. Suppose so, Alex agreed listlessly. Then, with an effort, she threw the hospital off. That's over, anyhow. I shan't go again. Let's come and do something awfully different now. They did. 6. When Alex got back to Violette, she was met in the little linoleumed hall by distress and pity, and Mrs. Frampton preparing to break something to her, with a kind, timid arm round her shoulders. Dearie, there was a telegram. You were out, so we opened it. Now you must be ever so brave. Oh, said Alex, rigid and leaning on her stick, and whitely staring from narrowed eyes. No! Oh, darling child, it's sad news. I don't know how to tell you. Dear, you must be brave. Oh, do get on, muttered Alex, rude and sick. Dearie. Mrs. Frampton was crying into her handkerchief. Poor Paul, your dear little brother. Dreadfully, badly wounded. Dead, Alex stated flatly, pulling away and leaning against the wall. Violette was hot and smelt of food. Florence stumbled up the kitchen stairs with supper. From a long way off, Mrs. Frampton sobbed. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. It's the Almighty's will. The poor dear boy has died doing his duty and serving his country. A noble end, dearie. Not a wasted life. Not a wasted... Alex said it after her mechanically, as if it was a foreign language. He died a noble death, said Mrs. Frampton, serving his country in her need. Alex was staring at her with blue eyes, suddenly dark and distended. The horror rose and loomed over her, like a great wave towering, just going to break. But, 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 she stammered and put out her hands, keeping it off. But he hadn't lived yet. Then the wave broke, like a storm crashing on a ship at sea. It's a lie, she screamed. Give me the telegram. It's made up. It's a damnable lie. The war office always tells them. Everyone knows it does. They gave it to her pitifully. She read it three times and it always said the same thing. She looked up for some way of escape from it, but found none, only Violette, hot and smelling of supper, and Mrs. Frampton crying, and Kate with working face, and Evie sympathetic and moved in the background, and Florence compassionate with the supper tray, and a stuffed squirrel in a glass case on the hall table. Alex shivered and shook as she stood, with passion and sickness and loss. But, but, 
she began to stammer again helplessly like a bewildered child but he hadn't lived yet kate said gently he has begun to live now dear for ever and ever world without end amen added mrs frampton mopping her eyes alex looked past them at the stuffed squirrel it's just some silly lie of course she said indifferent and quiet but still shaking it will be taken back tomorrow i shall go to bed now when kate brought her up some supper on a tray she found her lying on the floor having abandoned the lie theory having abandoned all theories and all words except only again and again paul 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 end of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Basil at Violette. June went by and the war went on, and the Russians were driven back in Galicia, and the Germans took Lemberg, and trenches were lost and won in France, and there was fighting round Ypres and Basil Doy had the middle finger of his right hand cut off, and there was some glorious weather, and zeppelin raids in the eastern counties, and it was warm and stuffy in London, and Mrs. Sandomir wrote to Alex from the United States that more than ever now, since their darling ball was added to the toll of wasted lives, war must not occur again. July went by and the war went on, and trenches were lost and won, and there was fighting round Ypres, and a German success at Hocher, and the Russians were driven back in Galicia, and Basil Doy left hospital and went with his mother to Devonshire, and there were Zeppelin raids in the eastern counties, and the summer term at the art school ended, and Alex went away from Clapton to Wood End, and her mother wrote that American women were splendid to work with, and that it was supremely important that the state should remain neutral, and that there were many hitches in the way of arbitration, but some hope. August went by, and the war went on, and Warsaw was taken, and the National Register, and trenches were lost and won, and there was fighting round Ypres, and a British success at Hoha and in Gallipoli, and Zeppelin raids on the eastern counties, and Nicholas and Alex went away together for a holiday to a village in Munster, where the only newspaper which appeared with regularity was the Ballet de Hob Weekly Dispatch, and Violette was shut up, and Mrs. Frampton stayed with Aunt Nellie and Kate and Evie with friends, and Mrs. Sandomir wrote from Sweden that the Swedes were promising but apathetic, and their government shy. September went by, and the war went on, and the Russians rallied and retreated and rallied in Galicia, and a great allied advance in France began and ended, and the hospitals filled up, and there were Zeppelin raids on the eastern counties, and Mrs. Frampton and Kate and Evie came back to Violette, and the art school opened, and Alex came back to Violette, and the Doys came back to town, and Mrs. Sandomir wrote from semez le bain where she was staying a little while again with the friends and helping to reconstruct, that it was striking how amenable to reason neutral and even belligerent governments were, if one talked to them reasonably. Even Ferdinand, though he had his faults. October began, and the war went on, and Bulgaria massed on the Serbian frontier and Russia sent her an ultimatum, and the Germans retook the Hohenzollern redoubt, and the hospitals got fuller, and the curious affair of Salonica began, and Terry Orme came home on leave, and Basil Doy, interviewed by the medical board, was told he could not rejoin yet, visited Cox's, and coming out of it, met Alex going up to the Strand. 2. Alex saw him first. 
he looked listless and pale and bored and rather cross, as he had done last time she saw him, a week ago. Basil was finding life something of a bore just now, and small things jarred. It was a nuisance, since he was on this ridiculous fighting business, not to be allowed to go and fight. There might be something doing any moment out there, and he not in it. His hand was really nearly all right now, and anyhow it wasn't much fun in town, as he couldn't paint, and nearly everyone was away. His eyes followed a girl who passed with her officer brother. He would have liked a healthy, pretty, jolly sort of girl like that to go about with, some girl with poise and tone and sanity and no nerves, who never bothered about the war or anything, a placid, indifferent, healthy sort of girl, with all her fingers on and nothing the matter anywhere. He was sick of hurt and damaged bodies and minds. His artistic instinct and his natural vitality craved, in reaction, for the beautiful and the whole and the healthy. Looking up, he saw Alex standing at the corner of the strand, leaning on her ivory-topped stick and looking at him. She looked pale and thin and frail and pretty in her blue coat and skirt and white collar. The Sandemirs never wore mourning. He went up to her, a smile lifting his brows. "'Good. I was just feeling bored. Let's come and have tea.' Alex wasn't really altogether what he wanted. She was too nervy. Some nerve in him which had been badly jarred by the long ugliness of those months in France winced from contact with nervous people. Besides, he suspected her of feeling the same shrinking from him. She so hated the war and all its products. However, they had always amused each other. She was clever and nice to look at. He remembered vaguely that he had been a little in love with her once before the war. If the war hadn't come just then, he might have become a great deal in love with her. Before the war, one had wanted a rather different sort of person, of course, from now, more of a companion, to discuss things with, more of a stimulant, perhaps, and less of a rest. He remembered that they had discussed painting a great deal. He didn't want to discuss painting now, since he had lost his finger. He didn't particularly want cleverness either, since trench life, with its battery on the brains of sounds and sights, had made him stupid. However, he said, let's come and have tea. And she answered, very well, let's. And they turned into something in the Strand called the Petrograd Tea Rooms. I suppose one mustn't take milk in it here, said Alex vaguely. She looked him over critically as they sat down and said, you don't look much use yet. So I'm told. They say I shall probably have at least a month's more leave. Well, I don't much care. There's a rumour my battalion may be sent to Serbia soon. I met a man on leave today, and he says that's the latest canard. I rather hope it's true. It'll be a change, anyhow, and there'll be something doing out there. Besides, we may as well see the world thoroughly on this show while we're about it. We shall never have such a chance again, I suppose. It's like a cook's tour gratis. France, Flanders, Egypt, Gallipoli, Serbia, Greece. I may see them all yet. This war has its humours, I'll say that for it. A bizarre war indeed, as some titled lunatic woman driving a motor ambulance round Ypres kept remarking to us all, Dear me, what a very bizarre war! It sounded as if she had experienced so many and as if they were mostly so normal and conventional and flat. Bizarre. Alex turned the word over. Yes, I suppose that is really what it is. It's the wrong shape. It fits in with nothing. It's mad. My cousin Emily says it's a righteous war, though, of course, war is very wicked. Righteous of us and wicked of the Germans, I suppose she means. And Kate says it was sent us for getting drunk and not going to church enough. I don't know how she knows. Do you meet people who talk like that? I chiefly meet people who ask me why I'm not taking part in it. There was one today in Trafalgar Square. She told me I ought to be in khaki. 
I said I suppose I ought, properly speaking, but that I was waiting to be fetched. She said it was young fellows like me who disgraced Britain before the eyes of Europe, and that I wouldn't like being fetched, because then I should have to wear C for coward on my tunic. I said I should rather enjoy that, and we parted pleasantly. The wide ones are two and eleven and three, and the narrow ones one and nine. I like B and H's better than Evans myself. The voice was Evie's. She was entering the Petrograd tea rooms with young Mrs. Vinney. She saw Alex, nodded, and said, Hello. It was Basil who made room for them at the table with him and Alex. The tea shop was crowded. He had met Evie once before. Oh, thanks, Muchley. Don't you mind? Evie was apologetic, thinking two was company. Mrs. Vinney was introduced to Basil, settled herself in her dainty fluffiness, emphasised by her feather boa, and ordered crumpets for herself and Evie. "'Quite a nice little place, don't you think so, Miss Sandemir? "'More a cherche than an ABC or one of those. "'I often come here. "'What's that boy shouting? "'The Germans take something or rather a doubt. "'Fancy! "'How it does go on, doesn't it?' "'Alex said it did. "'Quite makes one feel,' said Mrs. Vinney, "'that one oughtn't to be sitting snug and comfortable "'having crumpets, doesn't it? "'You know what I mean. "'It's just a feeling one has.' "'No sense in it. "'One oughtn't to give in to it, I don't think. "'Vin says so too. "'What's the use, he says, of brooding when it helps nobody? "'And what we've got to do is to keep cheery at home "'and keep things going. "'I must say I quite agree with him.' "'Rather, so do I,' said Basil. "'But of course it all makes one think, doesn't it?' she resumed. "'Makes life seem more solemn. "'Do you know what I mean?' and all the poor young fellows who never come home again. I'm thankful none of my people or close friends are gone. Mother simply wouldn't let my brother go. She says we've always been a peace-loving family, and she's not going to renounce her principles now. Percy doesn't really want to. It was only a passing fancy because some friends of his went. Vin says, leave war to those that want war. He doesn't, and he's not going to mix up in it. "'And I must say I think he's right.' "'Quite,' agreed Basil. "'All this waste of life and money, "'just because the Germans want a war. "'Why should we pander to them? "'That's what he says. "'Let them want. "'He's no Prussian junker, shouting out for blood. "'There's too many of them in this country,' he says, "'and that's what makes war possible. "'It's all for disarmament, you know, "'and I must say I think he's right.' If no one had any guns or ships, no one could fight, could they? Evie agreed that they couldn't, forgetting knives and fists and printed words and naked savages and all the gunless hosts of the ancient world. Violette thought always gaped with these omissions, it was like a loose piece of knitting, stretched to cover spaces too large for it and yawning into holes. Mr. doy has been fighting, you know, Evie explained, since Mrs. Vinney was obviously taking him for one who left war to those that wanted war. "'He's wounded.' "'Oh, is that so?' Mrs. Vinney regarded Mr. Doy with new interest. "'Well, I must say one can't help admiring the men that go and fight for their country, though one should allow liberty to all. "'I hope you're going on favourably, Mr. Doy.' "'Very, thanks very much. "'Well, we must be trotting, Evie, if we're going to Oxford Street before we go home.' "'Check, if you please. "'They're always so slow, aren't they, at these places? "'Good-bye, Miss Sandemir. "'Good-bye, Mr. Doy. "'And I'm sure I hope you'll get quite all right soon.' "'Basil stood aside to let them out "'and looked after them for a moment as they went. Three. "'He sat down with a grin. "'Makes life more solemn. "'Do you know what I mean? "'What a cheery little specimen.' I say, I'd like to draw Miss Tucker. Such good face lines. That clear chin and the nice wide space between the eyes. He drew it on the tablecloth with his left hand and the handle of his teaspoon. She's ripping to draw, Alex agreed. I often do her. And the colour's gorgeous too. That pink on brown. I've never got it right yet. I should think she's fun to live with, suggested Basil. She looks as if she enjoyed things so much. Yes, she has a pretty good time as a rule. 
"'You know,' said Basil, thinking it out, "'being out there and seeing people smashed to bits all about the place "'and getting smashed oneself makes one long for people like that, "'sane and healthy and with nothing the matter with their bodies or minds. "'It gets to seem about the only thing that matters after a time. "'I suppose it would. "'Now a person like that, who looks like some sort of wood goddess, "'I'd awfully like to paint her as a dryad, and looks as if she'd never had a day's illness or a bad night in her life. It's so, so restful, so alive, and yet so calm. No nerves anywhere, I should think. Being out there plays the dickens with people's nerves, you know. Not every one's, of course. There are plenty of cheery souls who come through unmoved. But you'd be surprised at the jolly, self-possessed sportsmen who go to pieces, more or less. All degrees of it, of course. Some don't know it themselves. You can often see it by the way their eyes look at you while they're talking, or the way their hand twitches when they light their cigarette. Alex remembered John Orme's eyes and hands. They dream a bit too, Basil went on, and his own eyes were fixed and queer as he talked, and his brows twitched a little. Talk in their sleep, you know, a walk. It's funny. I've censored letters which end... Hope this finds you the same as it leaves me, I in the pink, from chaps who have to be watched lest they put a bullet into themselves from sheer nerves. You'll see a man shouting and laughing at a sing-song, then sitting and crying by himself afterwards. Oh, those are extreme cases, of course, but lots are touched one way or another. I'm sorry for the next generation. They'll stand a chance of being a precious neurotic lot, the children of the fighting men. It's up to everyone at home to keep as sane and unnervy as they can manage, I fancy, or the whole world may become a lunatic asylum. I say, what are you going to do now? Buy some chalks, then go home. Violette? I'll see you home, may I? 4. They went to the chalk shop, then to the Clapton bus. The evening wind was like cool hands stroking their faces, it was half-past six. The streets were barbarically dark. One would think, said Basil, peering through the darkness at the ugliness, that in Kingsland Road, Zepps might be allowed to do their worst. On Spring Hill too, perhaps, Alex said. Slums and the screaming of the disreputable poor, villas and the precise speech and incomparably muddled thinking of the respectable genteel, which could best be spared. But Basil said, Oh, Spring Hill! Spring Hill is full of joy and dryads. Kate is afraid a very common type of person is coming to live there. We're getting nervous about it at Violette. We're very particular, you know. Alex, with the instinct of a cad, was laughing at Violette, wanting him to laugh with her. Sure to be, he returned. And Alex realised blankly that he might laugh at Violette to her heart's content and his attitude towards dryads and Evie Tucker's face lines would remain unaltered by his mockery. With a revulsion towards breeding, she said, They're most awfully kind. Here's where I get off. He got off too, and they walked down Upper Clapton Road. 5. Someone came behind them, walking quickly, came up with them, slowed and looked. Here we are again said Evie, in her clear gay voice. You're coming in to see us, Mr. Doy, I hope. Basil glanced from Alex to Evie. They were passing under a dim lamp, which for a moment threw Evie's startling prettiness in lit relief against the night. Extreme prettiness is not such a common thing that one can afford to miss chances of beholding it. Basil said, Well, may I? Evie returned, Rather, stop to supper. I can't do that, thanks very much, but I'll come in for a moment, if I may. As they entered Violette's tiny hall, the clock struck seven. They went into the drawing-room, where Mrs. Frampton and Kate sat knitting. It was stiff and prim and tidy, and rather stuffy, and watched from the wall by the monstrous eye. "'Here's Mr. Doy, mother,' said Evie. "'He saw Alex home.' Mr. Doy was introduced to Kate. 
Mrs. Frampton said how kind it was of him to see Alex home. Particularly with the streets black like they are now. Have we a right to expect to be preserved if we go against all common sense like that? I never do, said Basil, meaning he never expected to be preserved. But Mrs. Frampton took it that he never went against common sense. Well, I'm sure I go out after dark as little as I can. But the girls have to, coming back from work, and it makes me worry for them. Now you sit in that easy chair, Mr. Doy, and make yourself comfortable, and rest your hand. It's going on well, I hope. You'll stop and have some supper, of course. We'll have it at half-past seven, so it won't keep you long. Basil said he wouldn't, because he was dining somewhere at eight. They talked of the news. Mrs. Frampton said it seemed to get worse each day. She had been reading in the paper that Bulgaria was just coming in. Was that really so? Mrs. Frampton was of those who inquire of their male acquaintances and relatives on these and kindred subjects, and believe the answers more particularly when the males are soldiers. Basil Doy, used to his mother, who told him things and never believed a word he said, because, as she remarked, he was so much younger, found this gratifying, and said it was really so. Mrs. Frampton said, Dear me, it seems as if all the world would have to come in in time. And what about poor Serbia? Could she be saved? Basil, wanting to leave the state of Europe, and ask Evie if she had seen any plays lately, said casually that Serbia certainly seemed to stand a pretty good chance of being done in. And then, I suppose, said Mrs. Frampton, we shall have the poor Serbian refugees fleeing to us for safety, like the Belgians. I'm sure we shall all welcome them, the poor mothers with their little children, but it will be awkward to know where to put them, or what to do with them. They've got those two houses at the corner of the common, full of Belgians now. I wonder if the Belgians and the Serbs would get on well together in the same houses. They say the poor Serbs are very wild people indeed, with such strange habits. Do you think we shall all be asked to take them as servants? Sure to be, said Basil his eyes on Evie. Evie sat doing nothing at all, healthy, lovely, amused, splendidly alive. The vigorous young bodily life of her called to Basil's own, reanimating it. Alex sat by her, all alive too, but weak-bodied, lame, frail-nerved, with no balance. Kate knitted and was different. "'It'll be quite a problem, won't it?' said Mrs. Frampton. My maid tells me girls can't get enough places now. People all take Belgians instead. They say the Belgian girls make very rough servants. We know those who have them, said Kate, who had the Violette knack of switching off from the general to the personal. To Violette there were no labour problems, only good servants and bad. No Belgian or Balkan problem, only individual Belgians and Serbs, poor things with their little children and strange habits. They had the personal touch, which makes England what it is. Mrs. Frampton wanted to know next, And I suppose we shall be having conscription very soon now, Mr. Doy, shall we? Lord Northcliffe says so, doesn't he? Basil returned absently. Mrs. Frampton accepted that. Well, I suppose it has to be. It seems hard on the poor mothers of only sons, and on the poor wives too. But if it will help us to win the war... We mustn't grudge them, must we? I suppose it will help us to victory, won't it? Lord Northcliffe says that too, I understand. What do you think, Miss Tucker? He turned to Evie to hear her speak. She said, Oh, don't ask me. I don't know. Don't suppose it'll make much difference. Things don't, do they? Basil chuckled. Precious little as a rule. So that settles that. He caught sight of the clock and got up. I say, I'm afraid I've got to go at once. I shall be awfully late and rude. I often am since I joined the army. I was a punctual person once. The war is very bad for manners and morals. Have you discovered, Mrs. Frampton? Oh, well, Mrs. Frampton spoke condoningly. I'm sure we must all hope it won't last much longer. How long will it be, Mr. Doy? Can you tell us that? Seven years, said Mr. Doy. Till October 1922, you know. 
Yes, awful, isn't it? I'm frightfully sorry I had to tell you. Goodbye, Mrs. Frampton. He shook hands with them all. His eyes lingered, bright and smiling, on Evie, as if they found her a pleasant sight. In Alex that look seemed to stab and twist like a turning sword. Perhaps that was what men felt when a bayonet got them. The odd thing in the psychology of it was that she had never known before that she was a jealous person. She had always, like so many others, assumed she wasn't. Certainly Evie's beauty had been to her till now pure joy. As she went to the door with Basil, he said, I say, I wish you and your cousin would come into the country one Sunday. We might make up a small party. Your cousin looks as if she would rather like walking. She's rather past it, I'm afraid, said Alex, and added in answer to his stare, Cousin Emily, you mean, don't you? The Tuckers aren't my cousins, you know, and she's only a dead cousin's wife. The Tuckers aren't even that. No, hardly that, I suppose. Well, ask Miss Tucker if she'd care to come, will you? I should think she'd be rather a good country person. We might go next Sunday, if it's fine. Alex did not remark that Kate was not a particularly good country person. She merely said, All right, mind the step at the gate. Good night, and shut the door. 6. She stood for a moment, listening to the tread of his feet along the asphalt pavement, then sat down on the umbrella stand thoughtfully. For a moment it came to her that among the many things the war had taken from her, Paul, Basil, sleep at nights, were two that mattered just now particularly, good breeding and self-control. She knew she might feel and behave like a cad, and also that she might cry. It was the second of these that she least wanted to do. She had to be very gay and bright. For a moment her fingers were pressed against her eyelids. When she took them away, she saw balls of fire dancing all over the hall and up the stairs. "'I shall ask Kate,' she said. Florence came up the kitchen stairs with food. Kate came out of the sitting-room to help her set the table. Alex said, "'Let me help, Kate,' and began to bustle about the dining-room. "'You're giving Mother Evie's serviette,' said Kate, who probably thought this outburst of helpfulness more surprising than useful. "'By the way, Kate,' said Alex suddenly, giving Mrs. Frampton Kate's serviette instead, I suppose you wouldn't care to come for a long walk in the country on Sunday. I'm going with Basil Doy and some other people, and he asked me to ask you. Kate looked repressive. Considering my class in church, and that I never take train on Sunday, it's so likely, isn't it? And I rather wonder you like to go these Sunday outings, Alex. Don't you think it's nice to keep one day quiet, not to speak of higher things, with all the rushing about you do during the week? Kate felt it her duty to say these things sometimes to Alex, who had not been well brought up. "'It might be nice,' returned Alex, absently juggling with napkins. "'But it's difficult, rather. "'I say, I believe I've got these wrong still. "'I must go and change now.' She found Evie changing already, cool, clear-skinned, cheerful, humming a tune. It was difficult to speak to Evie, but Alex did it. She even hooked her up behind. She saw Evie's reflection in the glass, pretty and brown. She tried not to think that Evie was gayer than usual, and knew she was. She changed her own dress and talked fast. She saw her face in the glass. It was flushed and feverish. 7. They went down to supper. There was cold brawn and custard and stewed apple and cheese and what Violette called preserve. An excellent meal, but one in which Alex found no joy. She wanted something warming. It was a pity Mr. Doy wasn't able to stay, said Mrs. Frampton. He's quite full of fun, isn't he? Talks a lot of nonsense, I think, said Evie. The brawn would hardly have been sufficient, said Kate, meaning if Mr. Doy had been able to stay. 
"'A little custard, love,' Mrs. Frampton said to Alex. "'Why, you don't look well, Alex. "'You look as if you had quite a temperature. "'I hope you've not a chill beginning. "'These east winds are so searching and your necks are so low. "'You'd better go to bed early, dear, "'and Florence shall make you some hot currant tea.' "'Florence says,' said Kate, reminded of that, "'that those people at Primrose have lost their third girl this month. "'The girl simply won't stay, and Florence says she doesn't blame them. "'They're dreadfully common people, I'm afraid, those Primrose people. "'There are some funny stories going round about them, "'only, of course, one can't encourage Florence to talk. "'I believe the amount of wine and spirits they take in is something dreadful. "'In wartime, too. "'It does seem sad, doesn't it?' You'd think people might restrain themselves just now, but some seem never to think of that. Mr. Allison says all this luxury and intemperance is quite shameful. He preached on it on Sunday night. His idea is that the war was sent us as a judgment for all our wicked luxury and vice, and it will never cease till we are converted, Lord Derby or no Lord Derby, conscription or no conscription. He says all that is just a question of detail and method. "'but the only way to stop the war is a change of life. "'He was very forcible, I thought. "'Perhaps,' said Mrs. Frampton, "'that's what Mr. Doy meant when he said, "'didn't he know how all these measures, conscription and so on, "'don't make much difference after all. Oh, "'No, it was Evie said it, wasn't it? "'And Mr. Doy agreed and seemed quite pleased with her, I thought. "'Perhaps he meant the same with Mr. Allison about a change of life. "'I expect he's very good himself, isn't he, Alex?' Evie, to whom goodness meant dullness, said, "'I bet he isn't, is he, Al?' "'I don't know,' said Alex. "'You'd better ask him.' She added after a moment, "'I'll ask him for you on Sunday, if you like. "'We're going out somewhere, if it's fine.' "'It was very kind of him to ask me, too,' said Kate. "'You must explain to him how it is I can't, with its being Sunday.' Across the table... Alex's eyes met Evie's, suddenly widened in guileless, surprised mirth, with a touch of chagrin. Evie said, "'Why, whatever did he ask Kate for? He might have known she wouldn't. Men are. "'You're not coming, you're not coming, you're not coming,' said Alex within herself, breathing fast and clenching her napkin tight in her two hands and staring across the table defensively out of narrowed eyes. So they left it at that. 8. But in the night, Evie won. One may begin these things, if sufficiently unhinged and demoralised by private emotions and public events, but one cannot always keep them up. The policeman paced up and down, up and down Spring Hill. The rain dripped, the gutters gurgled, Evie breathed softly asleep. The dark night peered through waving curtains. Alex turned her pillar over and over and cursed. "'I suppose,' she said at last at 2 a.m., "'she's got to come.' At 2.30 she said, "'It will be a beastly day,' and sighed crossly and began to go to sleep. 9. At half-past seven, while Evie did her hair, Alex said on a weary yawn, "'I say,' "'You'd better come out with us on Sunday, as Kate won't.' "'Evie, with hairpins in her mouth, said, "'Me? Oh, all right, I don't mind. Will it amuse me? What's the game?' "'Oh, nothing especial. Just a day in the country. "'No, I shouldn't think it would amuse you much, "'especially as you won't know hardly any of the people. "'But come if you like.' "'You're awfully encouraging,' Evie considered it, and pinned her hair up. "'Oh, I expect I may as well come.' It will be cheerier than stopping at home, and I rather like meeting new people. All right, I'm on. Gracious, there's the bell. You'll be late, child. If they're half as particular at your shop as they are at mine, you must get into a lot of rows. So that was settled. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Non-Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Sunday in the Country. Sunday morning was quiet and misty, and Clapton was full of bells. At Violette on Sundays, each person led a different life. Kate, who attended St. Austin's Church, went to early Mass at eight, sung Mass for children at 9.45, Sunday school at 10.30, Matins, said hastily, at 11, High Mass, sung slowly, at 11.30, Children's Catechising at 3, and even song at 7. Mrs. Frampton went to a quite different church at 11 o'clock Matins, and once a month, the first Sunday, did what was called in that church staying on. She often went again in the evening. Evie often accompanied her mother, and found, as many have, that after church is a good time and place for gathering together with friends. Alex did not attend church, not having been brought up to do so. She often went off somewhere on Sunday with friends, as today. Mrs. Frampton said at breakfast, "'Take warm coats, dears. It's quite a fog, and your cough sounds nasty, Alex, love. And don't leave your umbrellas. It might very well turn to rain.' "'It's quite cold enough for furs, I think,' said Evie, pleased, because her furs became her. Through a pale blurred morning, Alex and Evie travelled by bus and metropolitan to Victoria. Evie, lithe and fawn-like in dark brown, with her wide, far-set, haunting eyes and sudden dimples, was a vivid note in the blurred world. Anyone must be glad of her. Evie needed not to say words of salt or savour. Her natural high spirits and young buoyancy were lifted from the commonplace to the charming by her face and smile. Alex by Evie's side was pale and elusive and dim. Her only note of colour was the dark shadowed blue of her black-lashed eyes. She coughed and her throat was sore. She talked and made Evie laugh. 2. They entered Victoria Station at 10.29, waiting in the booking hall were their friends, Basil Doy, a married young man and young woman of prepossessing exterior, two or three others of both sexes, and Terry Orme with a friend, both on a week's leave. Terry was spending the weekend in town with another subaltern, and was joining in the expedition at Alex's suggestion. Alex was fond of Terry, who was John's younger brother, and a fair, serene, sweet-tempered, mathematical, very musical person of nineteen. He seemed one of those who, as Basil Doy had put it, come through the war unmoved. His smile was sweet and infectious, and he was restful and full of joy, and could consume more chocolates at a sitting than anyone else, of over fifteen, that he knew. His friend was a cheery, sunburnt youth called Ingram, who had got the DCM. Terry said, "'Hello, Alex, how are you?' and had the gift of showing, without demonstration, that he knew things were rotten for her because of Paul. He was a sympathetic boy and tender-hearted, and thought Alex looked in poor case, quite different from his own vigorous and cheerful and busy sisters at Wood End. But then, of course, he and John hadn't been killed, and Paul had. It was frightfully rough luck on Alex. Terry was inclined to think that people out there had much the best of it on the whole, beastly as it often was, and interrupting to the things that really mattered, such as music and Cambridge. Evie was introduced to everyone, and they all had a friendly and pleased look at so much grace and vividness. In the train they filled a compartment. Alex sat between Terry and the married young man who was something in a government office. Opposite were Evie and Basil and the married young woman who had lovely furs and a spoilt, charming face and was selfish about the foot warmer. In the train they read a newspaper. Evie got the impression from their manner of reading it that they all knew beforehand what the news was and a good deal more than was in the paper too. Perhaps this impression was produced merely by nobody saying fancy, as they did at Violette. 
From their style of comment, Evie was inclined to gather that some of them had helped to write the paper, and that others were acquainted with the unwritten facts behind, and so different from, the printed words. Perhaps it was merely that they had studied last night's late editions, or perhaps some were journalists, others makers of history, others gifted with invention. Anyhow, they seemed to think they knew as much as, or a good deal more than, the paper did. Even the married young woman stopped for a moment, being sleepy and sulky about the cold, to contribute something she had heard from a foreign office man at dinner. "'He was pulling your leg,' her husband said. "'Lindsay always does. He thinks it's funny.' Evie thought him and his high, sweet voice conceited. Alex, looking at Evie opposite, speculated amusedly for a moment where Evie came in. Evie, who knew and cared for no news, and had heard nothing from people behind the scenes, and Nan even had her leg pulled by foreign office and men. Well, Evie, of course, came in on her face. It was jolly to have a face like that, to cover all vacancies within. Evie sat there, understanding little, yet people spoke to her merely to discover what, with that face, she would say and what she said pleased and amused, merely by reason of its grace of setting. Evie shivered, and Basil asked if she would like the window up. "'Well, it is cold,' said Evie, and he leaned across and pulled it up, asking no one else. "'Thanks so much,' said Evie, taking it prettily to herself. Her face and eyes were brilliant above her furs. Basil, with an artist's pleasure, took in her beauty. Alex felt him doing it. Yes, Evie came in all right. They got out at some station. The air was like damp blankets, thick and pale and chill. There was no joy in it. Dead wet leaves floated earthwards, unhappy like tears. They started walking somewhere. Alex leaned on her stick. She could walk all right, but she limped. She might soon tire but she wasn't going to say so. They walked uphill on a forlorn, muddy road. They walked in groups of two or three, changing and mixing and dividing as they went. They talked. Basil, for a minute, was beside Alex. He said, I say, will this be too much for you? Do say if you get tired, and we'll stop and rest. Alex hated him because she was lame and he hated lameness, and loved wholeness and strength. She said, No thanks, I'm all right, and had no more to say at the moment. Her eyes were on Evie's back, where she walked ahead with Maynard, the married man. He thought she walked like Diana, straight and free with a swing. Alex turned to speak to Terry, who was just behind with his friend Ingram. He came abreast of her, answering, Basil caught up the two in front. "'You look pretty fit, Terry,' said Alex. "'Oh, I'm in the pink.' His fair, unbrowned face was serene and smiling. His far-set blue eyes were not nervous, only watchful, and seemed to see a long way. He hadn't got Basil's or John's quick, jerky, restless movements of the hands. He looked as if the war had more left him alone left him detached, unconsumed. Perhaps it was because he was a musician, perhaps because he was naturally of a serene spirit, perhaps because he was so young. "'Have a chock, said Terry, and produced a box of them from the pocket of his Burberry. Alex had one. "'How are they all at Wood End?' she asked. "'They too appear to be in the pink. They haven't much time to spare for me, though. They're so marvellously busy.' Mother always was, of course, but Margot and Dorothy are at it all day too now. I wonder what they'll do with it when the war's over, all this energy. Mother says the war has been good for them, made them more industrious, I suppose. It's a funny thought, that the war can have been good for anyone. I can't quite swallow it. I don't think a thing bad in itself can be good for people, do you? It's very bad for me. It's spoiling my ear, the noise, you know guns and shells and gramophones and so on. 
By the way, I wish you'd come and hear Levinsky with me on Monday night. It's a jolly programme. All right, said Alex, who found Terry restful. She talked to Terry and saw Evie and Basil walking in front, side by side, laughing. Evie's joyous young smile answering that other quick, amused, friendly smile that she knew. 4. "'You are all funny,' said Evie to Basil. "'No.' "'Oh, you are. You do talk so, about such mad things. "'Do we? What do you talk about at home?' Evie tried to consider. "'Don't know, I'm sure. Oh, just things that happen, I suppose, "'and Mother and Kate talk about servants and household things, "'and we all talk about the people we know and what they've done and said. "'But you, you all talk about... "'About the people we don't know, and what they've done and said, is that it?' "'Perhaps. And public things, out of the papers, and what's going to happen, and why, and pictures, and nonsense. Oh, I don't know. And you find such queer things funny. Anyhow, you all talk, even if it's only nonsense most of the time, and the girls and the men talk just the same way. That's funny. Alex is the same.' She's the queerest kid. Makes me scream with laughter often. She's a pet, though. She is, said Basil. But what people say, the way they talk, makes extraordinarily little difference, you know. It's what they are. The funny thing is, I didn't know that, not so clearly at least, till I'd been out of the war. A thing like a war seems to settle values somehow. Shows one what matters and what doesn't shovels away the cant and leaves one with the essentials oh dear me said evie sorry i'm talking rot what i mean is isn't it a jolly day and jolly country and don't you love walking and getting warm i suppose you chose your hat to match your face didn't you pink on brown don't apologize i like it yes the hat too of course but i didn't mean that well really said evie Five. They stopped at an inn for lunch. They crowded round a fire and got warm. They had hot things to eat and drink. They laughed and talked. Outside the wet leaves blew about. Alex's leg ached. Maynard, who talked too much and about the wrong things, persisted in talking about the psychological and social effects of the war. An uncertain subject, and sad too, but probably he was writing an article about it somewhere. It was the sort of thing Maynard did in his spare time. "'It's an interesting intellectual phenomenon,' he was saying. "'So many of the intelligent people in all the nations, reduced largely to emotional pulp, sunk in blithering jingoism, like a school treat or a mother's meeting.' His wife, who had been a bored vicar's daughter before her marriage, and knew said sleepily mother's meetings aren't a bit like that you don't know anything about them they mostly don't think anything about jingoism on the war except that they hope their boys won't go and that the kaiser must be an hard-hearted man that's not blithering jingoism it's common sense ingram the cheerful young subaltern said boldly i think jingoism is an underrated virtue there's a lot to be said for it it makes recruits anyhow as long as people don't talk jingo i think it's a jolly useful thing it's turning some of our best professional cynics into primitive sentimentalists anyhow said maynard thinking out his article it's making europe simple sensuous and passionate as evidenced by the war poetry that was poured forth in nineteen fourteen that flood seems little spent now I suppose we're all getting too tired of the war even to write verse about it, as evidenced also by the Hymn of Hate and the Deptford Riots and other exhibitions of primitive emotion. The question is, is all this emotion going to last and to be poured out on other things after the war, or shall we be too tired to feel anything at all, or will there be a reaction to dryness and cynicism? People, for instance, have learnt more or less to give their money away. Will they go on giving it, or shall we afterwards be closer-fisted than before? Oh, Lord, 
said Basil. "'We shall have nothing left to give. "'Not even munition makers will, "'if it's true that the income tax is going to be quadrupled next year. "'It's about five bob now, isn't it? "'Give indeed. "'People,' continued Maynard, "'still on his own train of thought, "'may be divided, as regards the ultimate effects on them, "'of any movement, into two sections. "'Those who respond to the movement "'and join in all its works,' and are propelled along in a certain direction by it, and continue to be so, and those who, either early or late, react against it, and are propelled in the opposite direction. Every movement has got its reaction tucked away inside it, and the more violent the movement, the more violent the possible reaction. The reactionary forces that come into play during and after war are quite incalculable, Goodness only knows where they'll land us, whether they'll prevail over the responding forces or not. For instance, shall we be left a socialistic, centralised, autocratically governed, pre-Magna Carta state, bound hand and foot by the Defence of the Realm Act, with all business state controlled, and all persons subject to imprisonment and sudden death without trial by jury? Or will there be a tremendous reaction? towards liberal individualism and laissez-faire. Who knows? None of us. What do you think about it all, Miss Tucker? He addressed Evie to tease her and make her say something in that fresh, buoyant voice of hers. She did. She said, I'm sure I don't know anything about it. I can't see that the war makes such a lot of difference to ordinary people. One seems to go on much the same from day to day, doesn't one? "'I'm not at all sure,' said Basil, suddenly interested, "'that Miss Tucker hasn't got hold of the crux of the whole matter. "'There aren't two sections of people, Maynard. "'There are three. "'The respondents, the reactors, and the indifference. "'Ordinary people, that's to say. "'What difference does the war make, after all, to ordinary people? "'I believe the fact that it, so to speak, doesn't, "'is going to settle the destiny of this country. "'People like you talk of effects and tendencies.' You're caught by influences and reactions and carried about, but then perish a thought that you're an ordinary person. You're only an ordinary person of a certain order, the fairly civilised, not quite unthinking order that sees and discusses and talks a lot too much. A thing like a war, when it comes along, upsets the whole outlook of your lot. It dissolves the fabric of your world, and you have to build it up again, and whether you like it or not it will be something new for you. But does it upset and dissolve, or even disturb very much, the world of all the people, the non-combatants, I mean, of course, not the fighters, who don't think, or only think from hand to mouth? There'll be no reaction for them, or any such foolishness, because there's been no force. Here's to ordinary people. He emptied his glass of beer, and if he seemed to do it to Evie Tucker, that might be taken merely as an acknowledgement of her discerning remark. "'Oh, mercy!' said Evie, on a laugh and a yawn. "'You do all go on, don't you?' Alex, black-browed and sulky, thought so too. Why talk about rotten things like these? Why not talk about the weather, or the countryside, or birds and leaves, or servants, as at Violette, instead of these futile speculations on the effects of a war that should not be thought about, should not be mentioned?' and would probably anyhow never, never end. It was Maynard's fault. He was conceited and a gas-bag, and talked about the wrong things. Terry Orme agreed with her. But young Ingram said practically, "'Surely that's all rot, isn't it? I mean, there can be no indifference in your sense of the word. Everyone must be affected, even if they haven't people of their own in the show by the general kick-up. I don't believe in your indifference. They wouldn't be human beings.' They'd be like the calm crowds in the papers, don't you know, who aren't flustered by zeps. I simply don't believe they exist. The fundamentally untouched, Maynard explained. Superficially, of course, they are, as you put it, flustered. They read the papers, of course, for the incidents. But the fundamental issues beneath don't touch them. They're impervious. They're of an immobility. They're sublimely stable. The war for them really isn't. The new world, however it shapes, simply won't be. What's the war doing to them? All the beastliness and bravery and ugliness and brutality and cold and blood and mud and gaiety and misery 
an idiotic muddle and splendour and squalor and general lunacy. You'd think it must overturn even the most stable. Do something with them. Harden them or soften them or send them mad or teach them geography or foreign politics or knitting or self-denial or thrift or extravagance or international hatred or brotherhood. But has it? Does it? I believe often not. They haven't learned geography because they don't like using maps. They've not learned to fight because it's non-competence I'm talking of. They've not even learnt to write to the papers, thank goodness, nor even to knit, because I believe they mostly knew how already, nor to preserve their lives in unlit streets, for they're nightly done in in their hundreds. Nor, I was told by a clergyman of my acquaintance the other day, to pray, for that is still hoped for them, I believe. The war, like everything else, will come and go, and leave them where it found them, the solid backbone of the world. The rest of the world may go off its head with ideas or progress or despair or war or joy or madness or sanctity or revolution, but they remain unstirred. I don't suppose a foreign invasion would affect them fundamentally. They couldn't take in invasion, only the invaders. They remain themselves through every vicissitude. That's why the world after the war will be essentially the same as the world before it. It takes more than a war to move most of us. We all hope our own pet organisation or tendency is going to step in after the war and because of the war and take possession and transform society. Social workers hope for a new burst of philanthropic brotherhood. Christians hope for Christianity. Artists and writers for a new art and literature. Pacifists for a general disarmament. Militarists for permanent conscription. Democrats say there will be a levelling of class barriers, and I heard a subaltern the other day remark that the war would put a stopper on all this beastly democracy. We all seem to think the world will emerge out of the melting pot into some strange new shape. Optimists hope and believe it will be the shape they prefer. Pessimists are almost sure it will be the one they can least approve. Optimists say the world will have been brought to a state of mind in which wars can never be again. Pessimists say, on the contrary, we are in for a long succession of them, because we have revived a habit, and habit forms character, and character forms conduct. But really I believe the world will be left very much where it was before, because of that great immobile section which weighs it down. Mrs Maynard, who had been making a very good lunch, yawned at this point, and said, Roger, you're boring everyone to death. You don't know anything more about the future than we do. "'None of us know anything at all. "'You're not old Moore.' "'Oh, Moore,' Evie contributed. "'She had not been attending to Maynard's discourse, "'but was caught by this. "'Says something important in foreign courts "'is going to happen in November, "'connected with a sick bed. "'I expect that means the Kaiser's going to be ill. "'Perhaps he'll die.' "'Sure to,' agreed Basil. "'He's done it so many times already this year, "'it's becoming a habit. "'I say we ought to be getting on, don't you think?' Mrs. Maynard shivered and said it was quite an unfit day to be out in and she wasn't enjoying herself in the least and was anybody else. Basil said he was immensely and found the day picturesque in colour effects. Evie said she thought it was jolly so long as they kept moving. Maynard said it was jollier talking and eating but he supposed that couldn't last. Terry said it could if one had chocolates in one's pocket and didn't hurry too much. 6. Basil walked beside Evie. Evie's beauty was whipped to brilliancy by the damp wind. Evie was life. She might not have the thousand vivid awarenesses to life, the thousand responses to its multitudinous calls that the others had, the keen-witted young persons who had been bred up to live by their heads. But in some more fundamental way, she was life itself, life which, like love and hate, is primitive, uncivilised, intellectually unprogressive, but basic and inevitable. Basil had once resented the type. In old days he would have called it names, such as woman and violette. Now he liked woman, found her satisfactory to some deep need in him, the eternal masculine, roused from slumber by war, 
cried to its counterpart, ignoring the adulterations that filled the gulf between. Possibly he even liked Violette, which produced woman. Ingram walked by Alex. The yellow leaves drifted suddenly onto the wet road. Alex's hands were as cold as fishes. Her lame leg was tired. She talked and laughed. Ingram was talking about dogs, some foolish pug he knew. Alex too talked of pugs and chows and goldfish and guinea pigs. Ingram said there had been a pug in his platoon. He told tales of its sagacity and intrepidity in the trenches. And then it was a funny thing. He lost his nerve one day, absolutely, simply went to pieces and whimpered in my dugout and stayed so till we got back into billets again. He wouldn't come into the trench again next go. He'd had enough. Funny, rather, because it was so sudden, and nothing special to account for it. But it's the way with some men, just the same. I've known chaps as cheery as crickets, wriggling in frozen mud up to the waist, getting frostbitten, watching shrapnel and whizbangs flying round them as calmly as if they were gnats, and seeing their friends slip up all round them, never turning a hair. And then one day, for no earthly reason, they'll go to pot, break up altogether. Funny things, nerves. Alex suddenly perceived that he knew more about them than appeared in his jolly sunburnt face. He was talking on rapidly, as if he had to, with inward-looking eyes. Of course, there are some men out there who never ought to be out there at all, not strong enough in body or mind. There was a man in my company. He was quite young. He'd got his commission straight from school, and he simply went to pieces when he'd been in and out of trenches for a few weeks. He was a nervous, sensitive sort of chap, and delicate. He ought never to have come out, I should say. Anyhow, he went all to bits and lost his pluck. He simply couldn't stand the noise and the horror and the wounds and the men getting smashed up round him. I believe he saw his best friend cut to pieces by a bit of shell before his eyes. He kept being sick after that. Couldn't stop. And it was awfully sad. He took to exposing himself, taking absurd risks in order to get laid out. Everyone noticed it. But he couldn't get hit. People sometimes can't when they go on like that, you know. It's a funny thing. And one night he let off his revolver into his own shoulder. I imagine he thought he wasn't seen. But he was, by several men, poor chap. No one ever knew whether he meant to do for himself or only to hurt himself and get invalided back. Anyhow, things went badly, and he died of it. I can tell you this, because you won't know who he was, of course. But really he was telling it, because like the ancient mariner, he had to talk and tell. He went on quickly, looking vacantly ahead. I was there when he fired. Some of us went up to him, and he knew we'd seen. I shan't forget his face when we spoke to him. I can see it now, his eyes. He looked back into the past at them, then met Alex's, and it was suddenly as if he was looking again at a boy's white, shamed face and great haunted blue eyes and crooked, sensitive mouth and brows. He stopped abruptly and stood still and said sharply beneath his breath, Oh, good Lord! Horror started to his face. It mounted and grew as he stared. It leaped from his eyes to the shadow blue ones he looked into. He guessed what he had done, and because he guessed, Alex guessed too. Suddenly paler and very cold and sick, she said, Oh! on a long shivering note, and that too was what the boy in the trenches had said, and how he had said it. Perspiration bedewed the young man's brow, though the air hung clammy and cold about them. I beg your pardon, said Ingram, but I didn't hear your name. Do you mind? Sandomir, she whispered with cold lips. It's the same, isn't it? He could not now pretend it wasn't. I'm sickenly sorry, he muttered. I'm an ass, a brute, telling you the whole story like that. Oh, I do wish I hadn't. If only you'd stop me. Alex pulled her dazed faculties together. She was occupied in trying not to be sick. It was unfortunate. Strong emotion often took her like that. In that too she was like Paul. I d d didn't know, 
she stammered, and never knew before how Paul died. They never said. Just said shot. He could have bitten his tongue out now. You mustn't believe it, please. Sandomir wasn't the name. It was my mistake. Sandberg, that was it. They never said, Alex repeated. She felt remote from him and his remorse, emptied of pity and drained of all emotions, only very sick and her hands were as cold as fishes. A little way in front, Evie and Basil were laughing together. A robin sang on a swaying bough. Alex thought how sad he was. She had a sore throat and a headache. The mist clung round, clammy and cold, like her hands. "'I don't know what to say,' Ingram was muttering. "'There's nothing to say.' Alex stopped walking. The sky went dark. Terry, she said. Terry was at her side. All right, aren't you well? She held on to his arm. Terry, I'm going home. He looked at her face. All right, I'll come too. If you're going to faint, you'd better sit down first. I shan't faint, said Alex. But I think, I think I may be going to be sick. Well, said Terry, just wait till the others have gone on or they'll fuss round. I say good-bye, all of you. Alex is rather done, and we're going to the nearest station for the next train. No, thanks. Don't bother to come. We shall be all right. Alex heard far away offers of help, heard Evie's, Shall I come with you, Al? And Basil's, What bad luck! And the other's sympathy and regrets, and Terry keeping them off. 7. Alex and Terry were alone together. Then Alex was, as she had foretold, sick, crouching on damp heather by the roadside. "'Have you done?' inquired Terry presently. "'Yes, I hope so, at least. Let's go on to the station. "'I wonder, is it something beginning? Do you feel like flu? "'Or is it biliousness or a chill? "'Or have you walked too far? I was afraid you had. "'I'm all right. Only that man, Mr Ingram, told me things.' and suddenly I felt sick. He told me things about Paul. He didn't know who I was. And then suddenly he knew, and I saw him know, and I knew too. Do you know, Terry? No, said Terry, levelly. I know what some men who were out there thought, but it wasn't true. Terry was a good liar, but now no use at all. Alex twisted her cold hands together and whispered hoarsely, "'You've known all the time, then. "'Oh, Paul, Paul, "'to have minded as much as all that before you died, "'to have been hurt like that for weeks and weeks.' "'She was crying now, and could not stop. "'Don't,' said Terry gently. "'Don't think like that about it. "'It's not the way. "'Don't think of Paul, "'except that he got out of it quicker than most people.' and is safe now from any more of it. One's got to keep on thinking of that, when any of them slip up. I hoped you'd none of you ever know. That bungling ass. Alex, don't. It was such a short time he had of it. Alex gasped. Her hands pressed to her choked throat. It seemed hundreds of years to him, hundreds and hundreds of years, of being hurt like that hurt more than he could bear till he had to end it. He was such a little boy, Terry. He minded things so much. The thing is, Terry repeated, frowning and prodding the mud in the road with his stick, not to think, not to imagine, not to remember. It's over, don't you see, for Paul. He's clean out of it. It's a score for him, really, as he was like that and did mind so much. "'It will be easier,' said Alex presently, husky and strangled. "'If he hadn't liked things so much, too. "'If he hadn't been so awfully happy. "'If he hadn't loved being alive. "'It isn't a score for him to lose all the rest of his life "'that he might have had afterwards.' "'No,' Terry agreed sadly. "'It isn't. It's rotten luck, that is. Simply rotten.' That's one of the most sickening things about this whole show. 
the way people are doing that. But there's one thing about Paul, Alex. If he'd come through it, he'd have kept on remembering all the things one tries to forget. More than most people, I mean. He was that sort. Lots of people don't mind so much, and can get things out of their heads when they aren't actually seeing them. I can pretty well, you know. I think about other things, and don't worry, and eat and sleep like a prize fighter. A chap like Ingram's all right, too. Lots of men are. Though what I suppose Ingram would call his brain seems to have gone pretty well to pot today. My word, I shall let him hear about that this evening. But Paul, Paul would have minded awfully, always. It might have spoilt his life a bit, you know. And worse things might have happened to him, too. He might have been taken prisoner. Paul, he added slowly, Paul is better off than lots of men. Alex was staring at him now with wide, frightened eyes. "'I say, Terry,' she said hoarsely, "'what what on earth are we to do about it all? "'It's going on now, this moment. "'I've tried so hard not to let it come near, "'and now, now,' she was cold and shaking with terror. "'Now you'd better go on trying,' Terry suggested, "'and looked at his watch. "'Thinking's no good, anyhow.' We ought to hit off the 3.15 with any luck. Are you going to be sick any more, by the way? I can never tell till just beforehand, said Alex gloomily. But I wouldn't be much surprised. That was a sad thing about the Sandemirs. When they began to be sick, it often took them quite a long time to leave off. It was most unfortunate. And they got it from their father, who had sometimes been taken that way on public platforms. Well said Terry patiently. 8. The others walked and had tea and walked again and took a train back. Londoners like this sort of day. They like to see hedges and grass and pick berries and hear birds. It refreshes them for next week's work, even though they have been at the time cold and tired and perhaps bored. End of chapter 9